May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Cute Audio podcast. I'm D.C. Puba of Cute Audio and Cute Archives, preserving the legacy of Shinju Suzuki and those whose paths cross his and anything else that comes to mind. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So today we have a guest, Eric Arno, who came to the San Francisco Zen Center uh, toward the end of Shunryu Suzuki's life, was around uh, many years and um, went through various uh, incarnations after that. Uh, he was living in uh, Sonoma County when I was, and I remember he was selling insurance. We didn't even get into that in this podcast. About 15 years ago, he went to Asia, and he spent a lot of time in China and in Thailand and uh, has, uh, practiced uh, Buddhism there uh, very sincerely. And uh, he's spending most of his time now uh, on mm, more uh, world issues uh, that concern him. There's a lot of stuff he's written on cute.com, links to his uh, Bumble Buddhist blog. And, uh, and uh, I'll probably add some more and some pictures, so just write Eric Arno, or just write Arno, A-R-N-O-W, in the site search box, and you can uh, find it there. Oh, listen, I just got a, I just got an email from him. We've had some back and forth, because I needed a picture. I got a picture of uh, a site. I, I, I want to look at it. It was a good picture. It was a, another podcast. And I don't think he does a lot of stuff like that. Uh, and it said, uh, the, the oldest, the site said, the oldest person in there. Oh, I can't remember. Um, I'll get it on uh, his uh, uh, cuke.com page. It was SEO. I, I didn't have time to look up and see what it was. Uh, but anyway... And then uh, I wrote uh, Barbara Winger. You know, I asked Derek for some older pictures because on uh, on Cuke dot com uh, we list the uh, podcast guests, and uh, we have uh, a now picture and a then picture. The now picture can say be anywhere in recent history, vaguely, and uh, the then pictures we like. You know, if it's somebody from Zen Center back when they were. Uh, a newer student. So he said he'd look for one. But anyway, Barbara Winger sent me one. Barbara Winger has, you know, over 10,000 photographs, uh, many of them uh, from the Zen Center crowd. And she sends me those all the time. Uh, I'm working with her right now on uh, a podcast with her husband, Michael Winger, which maybe I'll get up this this coming Saturday. Uh, take, it, 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 it takes a little bit of work. You'll see why. Mm. Anyway, oh, I wanted to show you what Eric wrote, wrote. You know, he said, I recall the story of Sudana, the final chapter in the Avatsamsaka Sutra, he traveled for years, meeting teachers. He studied with Avalokiteshvara, who taught him wisdom. But Samantabhadra taught him that wisdom is not enough. We must put it into practice. You're doing a damn good job. May we practice like Samantabhadra while always remembering the Kalama Sutra, which teaches to question everything. 
Thanks, Eric. Um, I didn't read this because he said I'm doing a damn good job. That's very nice. Uh, I get nice emails, messages sometimes, and I go, huh, I am? Mm -hmm. But so that's not why I read it. Although I didn't cut, I could have cut it out and been like really humble, but I didn't. But what I, the reason I wanted to read it was may we practice like Samantha Bahadra while always remembering the Kalama Sutra, which teaches to question everything. I do, and I, I've uh, always questioned Eric too, because he's frequently into things I'm not into. But uh, we remain friends, and um, uh, so you'll see. We have a nice talk. Uh, there was one other thing I thought I would read. Hang on. Uh, here it is. Uh, it's just in an email he wrote. Um, he was wondering about some of the things he would talked about and Maybe better not to include them. I get that a lot. Uh, he said, water under the bridge. Zen Center helped me when I needed it. I left when it became an impediment. End of story. Uh, now I just live in the formless Bodhisattva path. Well, that's good. I agree with that. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm into not just our the formless bodhisattva path that, that a lot of us have come to in our, in our waning years. <laughs> but I'm into sort of the nuts and bolts of it, uh, for whatever it's worth. Uh, you know, and some things, if they're a little controversial, if a person feels like, well, I shouldn't complain, but so-and-so. I don't know. It's the story of a wide community. And listen, all groups and communities have problems. And, uh, you know, a lot of it, really, we, we just, uh, you know, a lot of it gets buried. You know, the, the communities try to bury it, they should, you know, or, and people try to bury uh, un, un, uh, uh, unglamorous things from their past. And, and I do, too, to a certain extent. Uh, but um, anyway, in uh, Cuke Archives, I bring out as much as I can because it tells the real story more of uh, a community of uh, of this in this milieu, this this uh, event that happened around Junior Suzuki coming to America. What did he come into? What was it like? How did it evolve? How is it evolving? And um, what about all the people that were there? What about them? What, what, what did he, not only how did he influence things, how did things influence him? And even apart from that, what were things like? Um, so, you know, I'm interested in all that. And it's um, just a hobby to pass time. I really don't think, even though I spend a great deal of time on history and uh, bringing it up and uh, talking about it. Uh, I don't really think it's important. You know, what's important is uh, the immediate here and now, right? All that, chop wood, carry water. But um, it's, um, it's uh, just fun to do, and I think it helps us look at ourselves. The other thing, it puts me in contact with people all the time. And I frequently say that what it really gets down to is saying hello to each other. So, all right, that's enough. I'd love to tell you a lot more about what's happening here, etc. how my ha-ha writing retreat is going. But uh, that's enough of an introduction. So, after we've had our pause to meditate, let's give Eric a call and see what's up. So when you hear the bell, if you have such a mind, hit pause and meditate or whatever for as long as you like. And when you're ready, 
to come back. Hit unpause, and we'll be there to hit the bell to end the meditation or whatever, and we'll see what Eric has to say. Eric Arno. Hello. Hello. Good. Eric, here we are. We finally made it. Yeah. Yeah. A long time. How many yeah. years? Well, when was it we saw you in Chiang Mai? Mm -hmm. uh, um, I don't remember. Uh, must be six five years, years ago? Five years ago? Yeah. Right. Well, that's more frequent than most people I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you been back to the States? Uh, not since 2014. Yeah, I haven't since we came here in 2013. Uh, yeah. Mm. I, did a, uh, I did a session with Nelson Foster in 2014. Oh, that's nice. That was the last time. I, he's, I consider him to be my teacher, although I'm not actively practicing right now because... Um, uh, his he has a rule that in, unless you do a session with him every a session every two years, uh, at minimum, then I can't do doku phone. You know that is uh, doku san by yeah. phone. And I'm not I'm not like actively practicing now. I'm not sitting that much anyway. So, um, you know, I I feel like my practice is pretty internalized. Just I'm in the middle of writing a long article, and um, I'm referencing um, the uh, practice of, of um, universal friendliness, for example. So uh, you say you're writing something now. What's it on? Um, I'm writing about uh, my roughly uh, my month-long trip to Russia. I just came back from Russia. Wow. You were in Russia for a month. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, you write a lot about Russia. Uh uh, a fair amount. In in recent years, I've written a fair amount about it. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have uh, one um, one friend there who's a he's like a, he's a peace activist. He's done a lot of uh, very interesting videos, um, you know, on nuclear war, the danger of war, those kinds of issues, and and all of the, um, you know, the what can I say the the broader civil liberties and you know the whole geopolitical morass that we're in right now. It's like a yeah. massive, massive human, human kind Genjo Cohen, you know, which is yeah. really, really got us by the throat or by the balls, depending on what gender you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, basically what happened, you know, very briefly is that uh, in 2014, I tore the cartilage in my knee um, I decided that I should probably um, pay more attention to the financial aspect of my life. So I started an internet business. Um, I struggled with that for, you know, I'm, I still have it on a nominal basis, but it's really going nowhere. Um, but um, in 2015... Wait a minute. Uh, what type of business? It, I'm selling one product on Amazon, and I have a couple of websites that... Um, basically our information and they're called affiliate sites, which means that I, I discuss uh, both. My main website is called for, for knees com. It's a knee. It's, it's what? For? For, for knees, F-O-R-K-N-E-E-S.com. Oh, for knees.com. For yeah. knees, yeah. For knees. It's a knee health website because... I had torn the cartilage in my, I've injured my knee three times. My doctor told me I was going to need a knee replacement five years ago or even longer. Uh, this is, uh, what, seven years ago. 
he told me I need a knee replacement in five years. I thought, you know, the hell with that. So, you know, I basically paid attention to taking care of my knee. And um, so I, I started selling a product on Amazon, a knee sleeve, a knee brace to stabilize the knee and help with knee pain, that, which is, you know, from a product standpoint, it, it, it works. People like it. But um, being in Amazon is just, a, it's like a shark tank. You know, it's like the, the competition is terrible and you're up against huge players with massive budgets and massive, you know, teams of writers and promoters and, and all kind, you know, an advertisement specialist and things like that. I can't compete with them. So, um, uh, so that's, that's been a, so basically I, I, I made a pretty much almost certain decision that I'll just let my, whatever inventory I have run out and that'll be the end of it. Um, I have another website called fourknees.com in which I talk about knee issues and how to take care of your knees so that you won't have to, you know, how do you, how can you avoid surgery, basically? So how are your knees now that you haven't had surgery? Um, they're workable. You know, I basically, I can, I can't, I don't um, do, I don't jump, you know, I don't do high impact stuff, but yeah. basically I, I can walk every year, every, everywhere. Uh, when I was, uh, you know, in Russia, I was I would walk for you know five hours a day or more, yeah, and, and no problem. Yeah. So, um, so it's you know I mean, it's functional. You know, it's okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, what happened is that what see when you're when you're doing internet marketing, basically your major adversary is Google and the huge websites that have enormous budgets to basically squeeze out small businesses. So what we're seeing in the world, David, is, you know, this is capitalism where the big fish eat the little fish, and that is what, what happens. Yeah. And I'm a little fish, and I got eaten. <laughs> That's the long and the short of it. Yeah. So, uh, um, did you try a Facebook and YouTube? Uh, I put a few things on Facebook. I have a Facebook uh, page. You know, and I have a YouTube page, but the reality is that, you know, technologically, I'm really not, you know, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a marketer by temperament, first of all. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not really technologically very savvy anyway. Um, you know, I have friends here in the internet business who are multimillionaires because they really know how to do it. And they're friends of mine and they, you know, they've helped me. But um, I just haven't been able to do it, and so um, mm. so so in so in 2014 I started this business, and uh, you know I've continued doing that, and I basically stayed in Chiang Mai the whole time, except for a trip to Russia in 2015. And the reason I did that was because um, in 2013. Because I'm, a, I'm like a geopolitical news junkie. Um, I could see there was a crisis developing in Ukraine. And I made contact with people who were knowledgeable about this issue. And uh, it was pretty obvious what happened in, in Ukraine in 2013 and 14, And then 2015, huge war breaks out. Lots of people are getting killed. And I wanted to see what was going on. So I went, I didn't go into Ukraine, which is, which is just super dangerous. Yeah. I did go, I, I did go to Russia. Uh, I was in Moscow for Victory Day in 2015. And then I went down to Crimea to the city called Sevastopol, um, which is what Sevastopol in Sonoma County is named after. Right. Where I used to live. And yeah, you've been right. there. You've been there visiting been me. There. Yeah, exactly. Many, many times. And I just and I just thought I got to go to see this Sevastopol. What's this Sevastopol thing about, right? Now, now I did that partly for sentimental reasons because Sevastopol is, you know, kind of like my my sister city in um, in Sonoma County. I lived in Santa Rosa, but also because um, uh, after the the U.S. coup in 2014, uh, this woman, Victoria Newland, who is a, she's number three in the State Department right now, and she 
she engineered this coup in 2014. She said, don't go to Crimea, it's dangerous, the Russians have invaded, it's terrible, blah, blah, blah. I just think, you know, she's full of shit, I'm going there to see for myself. So I went there, and I had a, just a fantastic experience. Um, I, was, I was walking around one day, and I saw this building, and I thought, what a nice-looking building. Gee, this is a really nice-looking building. I wonder what it is. And I'm standing out there, and after a few minutes, this, this nice young man <laughs> comes out wearing green, nothing. He doesn't look like a policeman. He just looks like a kind of a, maybe a security guard or something. And he points to the building, and with my very limited Russian, I realize it's, it's FSB headquarters. It's, it's the FBI of Russia, their headquarters. <laughs> and I'm right outside it as an American. And what do they do? They say, um, this is F FSB headquarters. There's nothing really for you here. Please move along. Oh, uh-huh. Okay, so this whole thing of, you know, um, the danger to Americans and stay away from Russia and all that's all bullshit, you know. So, so anyway, I went there in 2015. I had planned to go back in 2020. Uh, COVID hit, so I couldn't go back. I had plane tickets. I had my visa and everything. Couldn't go back. And then um, in um, early in this year, I thought, you know, Eric, you've been in Chiang Mai. You haven't done anything. You haven't gone anywhere since 2015. And so I thought, I think what I should do is do a yoga retreat um, because I can feel myself getting stiffer and stiffer. And, you know, I'm sure you understand what, what I'm talking about here. Mm -hmm. So I went to uh, this yoga retreat in the south of Thailand in one of these islands, these like paradise type islands. And there was a... Russian Which one? Copenhagen. Kopanyang. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, it's near Koh Samui. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, I've been to Koh Samui and Koh Tao, but I haven't been to Kopanyang. Right. So, anyway, so there I am in Kopanyang, and there's this Russian yoga teacher. It's absolutely gorgeous, wonderful Russian yoga teacher. And um, we had some really great conversations, and, and um, she has a or had, I don't know whether she has or not, uh, a boyfriend who said, well, if you want to go to Russia, here's how to do it. Because you see, the um, the Western websites that, you know, like cheap tickets and those kinds of things, they've all blocked um, ways to get to Russia. And the Russian Airlines has, has not flown from Thailand since COVID. So... He told me how to go to a Russian website where I could actually book a ticket uh, from from Thailand and get to, to get to um, Moscow. And so um, so this year I I did a bunch of yoga, and um, I'm not sure if it's helped me. I think I actually kind of overdid it, and I had to come back and do some physical therapy because I threw my back out. <laughs> 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 Burden, <laughs> and, and then and then I and I had I had like a month to recover from that. I I did recover enough to you know take the flight. It was like a harrowing, you know, like twenty five hour flight, you know, from Chiang Mai to to Moscow uh, through Dubai, which included a, a, a an eight hour layover in the middle of the night. Uh, but I got there, and. Um, and then I just started meeting people, and uh, you know I had a really, uh, for the most part, a really wonderful time. Um, mm. So, mm. Um, so I had, I wanted to go there just to kind of. I went there for a couple of reasons. Uh, one was because in 2015 I had stayed at a hostel, you know, like a, a cheap hotel type of place, and uh, the owner there was very nice to me and cheap. She showed me around and she spoke English and gave me a lot of background history of the history of Sevastopol and, and, and U.S.-Russian relations and those kinds of the stuff that you would never hear, you know, anywhere else. Um, certainly not an American um, academic or mainstream stuff, um, but all verifiable uh, once you once you know the story. And, um, and I had... I had seen a patch of land. At this point, this now, 
Sevastopol is now under Russian, this is 2015, it's been under Russian control for about a year. And you can see that the place is serious, has been seriously neglected. They had buses that were 30 years old and breaking down and a lot of, you could just, it was just, the economy was not good. You could just see that. And um, so I saw this patch of land that looked like it could use a garden. I said, you know, I'll come back and I'll make a garden. I'll pay for the garden. You guys do the work. I'll pay to put in some fruit trees and, and things like that. And we'll have a community garden. And she was, you know, very happy about that. So that was the plan. I had planned to go back in 2020. It fell through. I came back again. And when I got there, uh, I realized that uh, she was really not in a position to, to do anything about that. And so, um, but that was one of the main reasons why I, went, why I went back. And the second reason was because with all this crisis that we're in the middle of right now, I wanted to see, you know, what, from a Russian perspective, what was going on. So, um, and there's a lot of, you know, controversy even within Russia about what is, what the nature of the situation is. Um, but, you know, it enabled me to get a firsthand perspective outside of what we hear on mainstream news, which is, you know, completely unreliable. Mm. So, um, so I'm writing about it in the process of writing about it. I took a lot of pictures and basically I'm doing a kind of a travelogue referring to pictures that I took. And um, because uh, I feel like um, some of what I talk about is uh, has background background information that would be very useful for for my readers, um, I do some internet research and and you know get um, internet sources that are that give people some historical perspective on on like I, I visited this. This, you've heard this is, you've heard of Stalingrad, mm -hmm. right? So Stalingrad was the turning point in World War II. Uh, it's now called Volgograd. So I went to I wanted to go there because this was like a major. This was like one of the biggest battles in the history of the world. Oh yeah. And I and I, I wanted to go there and see well you know what what went on and I wanted to meet Russian people and talk with them and what's their point of view on these things and. So I went to, um, I was in Volgograd for about five days and um, hung out with uh, three Russian guys. And uh, it was just, you know, really amazing. But for, I, can, I can say, well, here's the Russian museum that talks about it. But then I go into some detail about what actually happened there. What was, what was the, um, uh, the effect on the Soviet Union? What, what, what significance did it have? And... I feel that this is very important for people because when they get news reports now, they have zero context for how things actually happen. Things don't just happen. There's a huge historical basis for it. Any Buddhist who, who understands anything knows that karma is the result of massive, infinite causation. You know? And um, people only see the one item in front of their eyes, and they think, "Oh, that's reality." Well, no, this 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 present moment encompasses, you know, vast, you know, causes and conditions. So mm. uh, I wanted to write about it from that point of view, so that people could at least get some kind of understanding um, mm. of, you know, what, what is our, you know, you can't solve the koan unless you get full up, get all the aspects of the of the issue. We have a, a a Russian friend here. She just arrived from St. Petersburg, mm -hmm. and and we've known her for years. And then Katrinka took her around the corner, oh, maybe a 10-minute walk to meet another Russian woman from St. Petersburg. <laughs> so they, right. they got to meet each other. There's a lot of Russians here. There's a lot of... Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, they were having problems... I haven't noticed anything recently uh, with their credit cards for a while. They were sort of shut off. Uh, they are shut off. Yeah, they are shut off. But they figured out uh, ways to get around it, I think, because I haven't heard anything about it recently. You've had so much uh, involvement with Buddhism in Thailand and uh, 
uh, China. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I've got links to stuff you've written and pictures on uh, both of them on cube.com. And your, do you, your uh, blog is, uh, can you remind us of what your blog is? Yeah, it's um, uh, Bumble Buddhist, as in Bumble B, but it's Bumble Buddhist. Yeah. Dot word. .wordpress com. Oh yeah, bumblebuddhist.wordpress.com It's had a tremendous amount on it. Uh, and uh, have you... Uh, uh, when, when was the last time uh, you were in China? Uh, that was uh, 2015 or 16. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my, my rip, my, my last... My last Buddhist contact with China was in 2014 when I did a, uh, you know, like a long retreat at one of the Chinese temples. What was that like? Well, it was probably life changing. I mean, I'm, I, I basically was on my own in a temple that was uh, hardly any, nobody spoke English. So, uh -huh. um, so the. Um, you the studied talking, some I, chi Chinese though, right? I studied some Chinese. I mean, I have survival, basic, you know, basic survival Chinese. Um, but, you know, in terms of having a, having an extended conversation, not, not much. Oh, yeah. So, um, so if you're in a temple, you know, and you want to practice, uh, you know, basically do a self session. But where was this temple? Well, the last temple that I stayed at was in... Um, it was outside of Xiamen, which is a city in the southeast um, section of, of uh, China. It's about, I think, two or three hundred miles north of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And that has that also has an interesting history because it was um, it was what is called a treaty port. Um, it had been because of the opium wars. It was uh, basically kind of commandeered by uh, several different countries where they had trading missions and they, they had pretty much control of the city. Um, and what's the name of the city again? Uh, X-I-A-M-E-N. And uh, what was the name of the temple where you were? Uh, Tong Bo Yen Si, T-O-N-G-B-O. Y A N is a Nancy mm -hmm. S I, which basically means kind of like uh, copper monks copper bowl temple because huh. it's the um, it's it's on a kind of a, a mountain. It's not a high mountain, but a, you know, a kind of a little bit of a mountain. It's kind of a dome shaped, you know, mountain. So they named it after, if you imagine a a monk's um, food bowl. You know, if it's turned upside down, it's kind of like a dome, and so and it's copper, so it's called the cop. So the a copper dome temple, mm. mountain temple, something like that. Oh, yen! I forgot. Yen is uh, that's also a cliff that has the meaning of cliff. So, it, it, but it basically it's got this it's got this image of a of a of a uh, a mountain bowl shaped place where this temple is located. Yeah. And uh, so uh, you were saying uh, that, that it was life changing. So how was it? Well, I'm life changing because uh, I decided to do a 100 day retreat. You know, I basically sat eight hours a day, you know, for 100 days. Pretty good. Good Lord. Yeah. But comes up, you know, basically I was, basically what I did was I, I would sit for an hour, um, do yoga for half an hour or so to kind of loosen up, sit for an hour, do yoga for another half an hour. We had, uh, they had, they did have um, meals three times a day, so I was eating, I, I ate three times a day there, unlike in Thailand where you can only eat two, maybe one a day. But, um, you know, when you sit for that length of time, you know, lots of stuff comes up, and um, I think it kind of, um, 
in, in addition to other retreats, I had done many retreats in, in many temples in China, especially the well-known temples like, um, you know, Mazu's temple or uh, uh, Zhaozhou's temple. Um, um, I can't think of all of them. I, I visited these places, you know, Baijiang, was, you know, the five, I actually went to where the fox's den was, where the, you know, the story of the, the yeah. fox. So you can actually go to these places, these physical places. I went to the stream where Dongshan was enlightened. <laughs> mm. I could look in the stream where he looked in the stream and nothing happened with me, but something happened with him. So at least I... <laughs> I had the the historical connection with Dongshan yeah. by seeing his his uh, you know his uh, reflection and seeing my reflection in the water. Uh huh. And so that's what. So I felt. Now the reason I did that was because you know I'm a Zen monk. By that is that is my temperament. You know that is basically what that is who I am. Uh, that is my temperament and my personality. And um, during my many years of study at the Zen Center, and later with uh, with Nelson Foster, um, I just had this very deep appreciation for Chinese culture and these Chinese monks who came up with these incredible stories about you know what what is real life about, and mm. I felt I felt a sense of obligation, gratitude, and a sense of obligation to go there. And pay my respects to these places mm. that had given that had given me so much. So, um, so that's what I did. You know, that was my multi-year plan. I visited probably most of the most of the most famous temples: Linji, uh, Dongshan, um, Zhaozhou, um, Nazu, um, uh, Yangshan. Um, Anyway, I can't think of all of them right now, but uh, like that's that's basically what I did. Visit all these temples. I stayed at many of them for um, the ones that you could stay at. I stayed at for several, you know, several days or even a week or more at a time, or about, as I say, up to three months. Mm -hmm. Did you go to Shaolin? No, I didn't. I had the chance to go to Shaolin, and um, what happened there was that. Um, is it Shuifeng? I think yeah, Shuifeng. Um, I was in the city um, near Shui, relatively near Shuifeng's temple, and I was introduced to a lady who wanted to take me to Shaolin, but I didn't go there because Shaolin is it's got two issues. One is that it's very very commercialized at this point. Yeah, and I've, the second, I've heard that. Yeah, and the second is that it's it's really it's more like a uh, kung fu temple, it's right? Not as not not a Chan temple, not a Zen right. temple, right? And so that was and it was that was not a, you know my agenda was I was going to visit I was going to take a a pilgrimage to visit the famous Zen temples where Zen really became Zen, you know, starting with Huinang's temple. You know, uh, I was at the the fifth fifth patriarch's temple, the fourth patriarch's temple, the sixth patriarch's temple, and that was in in um, Guangzhou. But you know, I visited these these very very famous temples. Hmm. Hmm. Um. And when did when did you uh, start going to China? Two thousand seven. And. When did you, um, you've gone to retreats in Thailand too, the Pasana retreats, right? That's right. Many yeah, well, of them. Have you done Goenka? Yeah, I've done, I've done, I actually did, uh, let's see, one, at least one Goenka retreat in Thailand. I did another Goenka retreat in, in uh, Myanmar hmm. and... Uh, now Goenka, of course, trained at, trained with this this um, lay person Uba Kim, who is the, the like the honorific name. It's like Mister, who is Mister Bakim. 
And um, they have a meditation center called the International Meditation Center. And I, I wanted to go there because with the Goenka system, um, it's a very, you know, it's an excellent system. You know, I, can't, I have no complaints about it as a, if you want to do a retreat and get a really crash course on Buddhist practice and meditation, the Lanka retreat is, is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, the issue is that if you want to kind of get deeper into the Goenka organization system, so to speak, they have requirements of you that I just feel are not appropriate. You know, they're asking me, you know, you have to sit two hours a day. You have to be strictly vegetarian. You can't do drugs or anything like that. Although that's, I can appreciate that, and I, it's not difficult for me to do. But I don't want an organization telling me what I can and can't do. Right, right. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so, um, so I just thought, you know, and they, they said, oh, and before you can do a longer retreat than a 10-day retreat, you have to read the Satipatthana Sutra and, Sutta and so on. And I could go to Ubakin Center and stay there for a month, no questions asked. Mm -hmm. So why would I, why would I, you know, try and fit myself into this bureaucracy when I can just go to this place and that? Uh, yeah. It was, you know, it was, it's, it's free. You know, the food is fine. Everything is, it's, it's perfectly great place to practice. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the issue for me, though, was that um, I, I felt a, um, the Mahayana is too strong in me. You know? mm -hmm. um, and the, the, I would say the Mahayana and the Zen is, it's, that is really my, what can I say, my DNA, my spiritual DNA. That's how I'm wired. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I felt uh, kind of limited by the Theravada practice and, I felt drawn to my the Zen roots that I felt you know, my connection with China. Right. Do you so, know about the Mahasi method of meditation? Yeah, I practiced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I practiced. That was the first um, temple that I went to was a Mahasi. It was very prevalent in. in yeah, China. that's and, what and, they have yeah. here, and mm -hmm. uh, and I've done a number of retreats here. Well, some of them they've. Uh, They've had all this stuff you're supposed to focus on. One teacher, anyway, did it on the walking meditation. But right. the Rise, rising, lifting, touching. Yeah, and, right. And, just like, you know, just please don't overcomplicate it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did it for a while, and then I thought, okay, that's enough of that. It didn't bother me not to do what they're doing. And uh -huh. uh, uh, but I like. The, the the Mahansi method, the teacher from it, I mean, basically, it was just focusing on the hara, on the breath going up and down. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, I I did find their sort of, what would you say, their, their understanding, if they talked about it, was, uh, uh, was not uh, what I've been taught. What? So can you be specific? Yeah, uh, some of it just seemed too literal. I mean, a lot of and a lot of the people I know who've done uh, Theravadan practice uh, are so into rules and uh, mm -hmm. very literal understanding of things. Uh, like um, it was interesting. Uh, one teacher said he asked. They, and very few talks, which I like, just an hour of sitting, an hour of walking all day long. Uh, but he, at one point he said, well, what is it that continues when we die if there's no self? And so nobody said anything, so I raised my hand and he said, yeah, I said, karma. He said, right. Uh, but then later... When we were to ask him a question at the very end, I asked him, uh, are body and mind one? He said, no, I guess not, because 
uh, something has to continue when you die. (laughs) 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 So, um, you know, uh, a lot of times, uh, but I, I don't care. I mean, it didn't matter to me. They gave a structure that was great and that was very difficult and demanding. Um, but um, when, did, when did you uh, ar- arrive in uh, Thailand? When did you first go there? Uh, to, well, I, I did a, a kind of a vacation trip in 2001, but my, um, my real, you know, I left the U.S. in 2004 and came to Thailand. Uh-huh. My, my primary goal there was to practice meditation. Mhm. Mhm. And um you've done a lot of that. Right now you're not doing so much of that. You said you're you've sort of internalized it and you're focusing on your writing. Mm-hmm. Right? Right? Um uh, well, I would say reading and writing and um you know, my I would say my my uh, my main uh, energy, such as it is, is taking care of myself because I, I'm getting older and uh, my body is not the greatest. You know, it's, I'm still, relatively speaking, quite healthy, but I'm feeling more frail. So I feel like I really need to take care yeah. of myself. So I'm going to yoga classes and I go to yoga classes three days a week. And Yeah, and that's um, good. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm basically, you know, I'm trying to take take care of myself that's one major issue and the second issue is that um because the um the geopolitical situation our whole you know our whole situation as a species and and so on is so uh, precarious right now that um i feel like um i personally cannot afford to just pay attention to little eric's you know world and you know, making a little world for Eric and yeah. like, comfort, comfort and so on. And, yeah. And, um, you know, when I was, I was actively involved in business and um, I, I have friends here who are in business and they're, they're like, you know, 30 to maybe even 50 years younger than me. And they're focused <laughs> on their business. And I'm thinking, you know, it's all fine for you to be focused on your build, business, but, um, you know, there's a, there's a a, um, a military analyst. He, he's a retired um, retired. Um, he was a weapons inspector during uh, the Gulf War, and then he he blew the whistle on weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, which didn't exist. He said, right. they "Don't exist. Don't go to war. They don't exist. This is not an issue." Right. They said. They said that was very clear. They, yeah. I said, "Get the hell out of here." And so he's been blowing the whistle, you know, ever since about this whole situation in, in Ukraine. And he's, he's very perspicacious. He says, we're one second away from midnight, you know, on the nuclear clock. That's how bad it is. And, you know, when somebody says that, and, and, and my friend Regis here, Regis in, uh, uh, my American friend who lives in, in Crimea also, uh, he did a whole, um, uh, you know, hour and a half uh, video uh, in 2016 talking about this very issue. So mm-hmm. um, we can, we can, you know, you can say because I have a pension that is not a lot, but it's enough for me to get by. Um, I have the luxury of paying attention to these things, and my my concern is that people are. Um, it's two aspects. One is they're they're extremely fragmented and distracted by the soap opera media um, deluge of bullshit that that we're fed on a daily basis uh, to either distract or simply disinform uh, that people really don't get what's going on. And the second issue is that people are so involved in their own life and their career and so on that they're not. And there's no Mahayana spirit here. You know, we need to be thinking about, as as Aitken Roshi said, we're all in this together and we don't have much time. 
Yeah. And, and so I feel uh, that is that statement alone. That is the operative principle that we need to be looking at. And we need to be looking at things from a, a wide perspective, taking into account uh, not just what we're told by our culture. You know, we have a very uh, Western people in the West, for the most part, are living in a very, very narrow-minded, constrained understanding of how the world works. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's extremely Eurocentric, America-centric, and it's like Western culture is is the be-all and end-all of human um, human development. Human right. Development. Well, it might be the end-all. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it may uh, be the end all. Right? Yeah. So, you know, Gandhi was asked, what do you think of human civilization? He said, it would be a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> he, uh, you know? you're right. He also said, if he could, he'd throw back, he'd throw in the ocean everything that India had gotten from the West, including penicillin. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I know uh, Tulsi Gabbard's. Um, uh, main concern uh, about the uh, what's happening uh, with uh, Ukraine, Russia, United States, and Europe is uh, uh, the threat of uh, nuclear war, uh, and um, uh, the uh, you know I've focused on the threat of nuclear war and climate change for a long time, uh, and. Uh, uh, it looks to me like we're doomed, but uh, anyway, I'm I'm glad you're trying. Uh, what do you think about climate change? Well, it's undeniable. I mean, you know, there's you know big, you know, we've got droughts going on in Africa. We've got, you know, the, the, we're seeing extremes of of climate, obviously. Right now, um, no, I suppose one could possibly make the case. For um, uh, you know, the sun has you know the climate has been changing for for more than millennia. You know, we had a, a you know an ice age ten thousand years ago, and now we have this other. We're in another age. Yeah, well, it's um, always changing. Yeah, it's always changing. So, so is it? So, are, are our current problems man-made problems, or are they not man-made problems? But the but climate change, you see, I, I also think that climate change is a red herring, so to speak, or a distraction from the larger issue of our, how we as human beings are treating the planet in general. Mm -hmm. We're overfishing. We're, um, we're mining the soil. We're not taking care of the, of the soil. Um, we are um, polluting it with all kinds of terrible chemicals. And we're waging massive wars, which are incredibly destructive of the environment. Yeah. And, and, not, and these, so just to say, oh, it's climate change is, is rather superficial, in my opinion. And I think that people need to take a broader view of all of human activity, and, but especially militarism, because the military is the biggest polluter and the biggest destroyer of the environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just see, you know, this this situation with this uh, this pipe, these pipelines that just got blown up. You probably have heard about this. Uh, you know, you have to remind me. You mean recently? There's been a pipeline blown up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is huge. This is absolutely huge. So um, Europe depends on cheap energy in order to fuel its economy. And the, uh, this um, crisis that has taken place in Ukraine um, has raised the issue of two major pipelines that go from Russia to Europe that supply it with very inexpensive um, natural gas, which is needed not just for heating, not just for creating electricity, but making fertilizer and making all kinds of other things. Well, um, a couple of days ago, um, both pipelines were blown up. Is that right? 
My, I you know, should pay yeah, more no, attention to this, the news. Oh my goodness, this is like this is huge because what this is doing is it's saying to Europe, you're going to freeze this winter. And your 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 industrial base is going to wither on the vine because you don't have the energy to supply your factories and everything else. And the U.S. says, well, we'll supply it to you. Of course, it's going to cost you five times more than cheap Russian gas because we, we got to frack our land and then we have to sh- liquefy it, and then we have to send it on ships and then we have to send it across the ocean and then you have to set up special you know, plants to process it. Um, but, you know, that's okay because now you're free of Russia's control. Well, that's great because you've just destroyed Europe's economy. And, but, the, but, but the environmental aspect of this is that when you have this massive pipeline with huge amounts of natural gas and it gets blown up, uh, you can see images of it on YouTube. Hey, hang on a sec. Let, let me see what this is. Just a sec, all right? Mm-hmm. Hello? Hello? Hello, Sorry, Tira Bichara. It's how you see book. Okay? Bichara Dengan Saya Hari Sabtu Atau Pangil Saya Nanti. Okay? Bye-bye. All right. Not bad, speaking Indonesian, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was um, our gardener. It didn't have his name. It just had a phone number. And he's um, he calls me all the time. He's a little crazy. Great gardener, but he's a little crazy. And so I just I told him, I'm not going to talk to you now. Uh, I see. Right. You know, right. I call that, later yeah. or something. Right. Um, so uh, anyway, I mean, if you just, you know, um, go on to... Uh, I and mean, I can send you some links of, you know, people are talking about this. This is a huge issue because it's not just a, um, this is um, basically what, you know, the commentators that I, and these are Western commentators, you know, and I'm not talking about CNN, I'm talking about independent people. Um, as what we're seeing is a huge shift of Western culture being supplanted by Eurasia. And as the West loses control, it is becoming more and more desperate. And as it becomes more and more desperate, it does more and more desperate things. You know, it did desperate things on 9-11, you know, having the war on terror to get control of the oil in the Middle East. And it's been um, expanding NATO, which is a huge threat to to Russia, which is causing major problems there. Uh, The Ukraine um, who major problems there, and now they've blown up this pipeline, which is going to uh, basically destroy Europe's economy. Yeah, well, and we'll see. So, but but the but, but from an environmental point of view, you've got an ocean with all the fish and the you know the the it's like the Exxon Mobil, you know what happened with the Exxon Mobil um, oil tanker that you know, lost all of its oil, and it, it polluted a, a large amount of the ocean. So this is uh, a pipeline that's blown up, and you could say, well, the good thing is that the gas is is uh, going up to the surface, and, you know, it's not necessarily going to stay in the ocean floor, but it's, you know, it's just one more assault on the environment. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, well... Um, uh, my understanding is that human beings have, uh, have eliminated half the, uh, uh, population of the oceans and half the population of the land, plants and animals and insects and everything. And, uh, we tend to be, uh, on, we tend, seem to be on a, uh, uh, full steam ahead schedule with it. Uh, yeah. And, uh, well, yeah, well, look, I encourage you to do all you can about it. Uh, it's very good. Uh, <laughs> if, if you, if you go to my website, you know, the, the, um, bubble com mm-hmm. website, 
Uh, I have a number of articles that are, these are more like uh, Russian based. You know, yeah. Because I've been focusing on the yeah. on the crisis of Russia. Although I, you know, I I, I maintain that uh, this is a we're in a we are in a we are in World War Three. It's not. It hasn't gone completely crazy. We're in a kind of a situation like in 1940 where uh, Nazi Germany had invaded Poland, but the situation was kind of like quiet for a while. Um, not too much was happening, but there's, but underneath the surface, there's a lot happening and a lot more that could mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. And so we're, so the, so we're in a, we're in a, a pivotal situation where um, with what I'm, what we can, what I'm hoping for is that through uh, shrewd diplomacy of Russia and China, they can kind of say to the West, you know, would you please just cool it here and let's work things out <laughs> through negotiation? Yeah, yeah. The, the more military pressure you put on us, the, the larger the possibility is of this getting really out of control. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that that's where we are right now. And that is where um, people, what I, I feel that people need to, Pay attention to, you know, a few people will listen to this and say, "Well, that Eric, you know, I, you know, you know, um, Putin is the is the devil incarnate." But well, maybe I should go to his website, and you know, he, he's been there. You know, he's not CNN, so he's maybe more objective and see what he has to say. <laughs> see yeah. what the Eric guy has to say. That sort of thing. Yeah, well, that's why I ask you to spell things out and uh, give. Uh, you know, to state what things are, how people can get to it. Um, you, uh, when did you come to Zen Center? 1971, March 1971. And um, so what was that like? Um, I was basically a emotionally disturbed, dysfunctional young man. <laughs> and I had no place to go. Uh, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't hold a job, and um, I was coming out of a very uh, toxic family situation. Mm. Um, I was uh, experiencing a lot of emotional trauma, mm. uh, which you know handicapped me, and is still basically it's you know. Um, uh, uh, I've still got a, a lame white leg, um, but you know I I understand my my uh, psychological disability and I'm kind to it and so I don't worry about it and so it doesn't really handicap me. Um, but uh, and of course I managed to you know by being at the Zen Center as long as I was, it gave me a chance to heal and take time to look at my life and. You know, get, give me some basis for, you know, a a value system. You know, in terms of Buddhist teaching, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that has been you know very very valuable for me. Um, but yeah, when I arrived, I was pretty messed up. So you had some experience with Suzuki Roshi uh, before he died. You arrived. Very little, very very little. Yeah, what do you remember about that? Well, I only remember two things. Uh, one was uh, when I was walking around the Zen Center building on 300 Page Street, and there he was in his, his white, light blue robes, you know, this little Japanese guy, and I was completely in awe of him. I mean, you know, I was, I was, I don't know if I could say I was afraid of him, but I was just speechless. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, one time I was sitting in the, um, the courtyard and he came up to me and he didn't look at me directly, but he just kind of was near me, probably kind of feeling my vibe or something, or I was feeling his vibe and that was that. Um, I never, stood, never said a word to him. Uh, the second time was uh, during, a, uh, during a session, I think it was the August session, and when I first came to Zen Center, I knew what my job was. My job was to sit. I knew that I was screwed up, and I and I just had this deep um, conviction. Um, I needed to stop, look, and listen. I need just needed to stop, 
and look at my life and just try and figure out what the hell is going on here. And so um, I was doing, I, I would do like a five day session as scheduled. And then I'd find some job at a candy store and they'd fire me after a couple of months. And I, th- I thought that's good. Now I can do another session. <laughs> that, <laughs> happens, that happens several times where I, I did a session, got a job, got fired, got, did a session, got fired, did a session, got fired. And, uh, but that was fine because I didn't really want to work. I wanted to sit. So mm. it was the, so I did the, I did the, um, I think it was the March, April, May, June, maybe, maybe it was the April session, the June session and the August session, I think. Oh, really? And in August, yeah. And so the August session, I remember, I'm pretty sure uh, that was the session where Nakagawa So and Roshi came and uh, he gave a talk. And Suzuki Roshi gave a talk, but there was, but um, my practice was very, very uh, weak. And I couldn't sit, you know, after the second day, you know, I was hopeless. You know, I couldn't, I, I couldn't stop moving. I was wiggling all the time because I was just in intense pain. And I didn't know how to, you know, take care of myself. So at one point it was like 8.30 in the evening. And Suzuki Roshi, this is August, for all your listeners, Suzuki Roshi died in December of that year. So he knew he was terminally ill. And, in August, and so he said, someday you're going to be on your deathbed and you're not going to be able to do anything about it. Don't move. Mm. And of course I kept moving. <laughs> that was out of control. But that was... <laughs> That was the main thing that I remember about um, about Suzuki Roshi. Ah, that's good. That's uh, yeah, a little scary. Pretty good. Hmm. Uh, well, then uh, uh, after he died, how did you continue there there in seventy two? Well, well, so I'm there in nineteen seventy one and seventy. Uh, Dick Baker shows up, and um, he had been in Japan, and he'd been called back. I didn't know. I have, you know, I'm a completely new student, totally clueless about uh, Sangha politics or any of that, and uh, I knew that a bunch of people had left the Zen Center when he came, but there he was, and he gave lectures, and I was, um, you know, I thought, you know, this guy is great, and I was very, uh, I think it was, you know, I I guess it was, the, I think it was the December session where um, that was the session where um, I'm sure you, you were probably there. At, uh, four no, I was at Tashihara. Oh, you were. Okay. So five o'clock in the morning. So we're sitting there and at a certain point um, there's some movement in the Zendo and people are all leaving the Zendo and we don't know what's going on. And then, and then, um, you know, I guess around eight o'clock or so, uh, we were told that Suzuki Roshi had died. And uh, that was a very powerful session for everybody, obviously. And yeah. at that, and when I, and, you know, I had listened to um, Richard Baker's um, talks. Uh, I guess he was, um, he was, he was made abbot in November, I believe. Um, in, in November. Yeah, I think you're yeah, right. I yeah, I remember. I was at the I was at the mountain seat ceremony. Right. And uh, what did you think of that? Well, I was, you know, I mean, I was impressed. You know, I just thought um, um, I, I didn't know what to make of the mountain seat ceremony itself, but um, uh, I was impressed by by Richard Baker. He be, became Baker Roshi, and so I had a um, you know, I just said uh, during that that um, during my last uh, dokusan with him, which I suppose I'm not supposed to talk about, but after all this time, I guess maybe it's okay. I just said, you know, you're great, and I I just want to be your disciple, and, and so um, that took me on the path of practice in the Zen Center from 1971 until 2000 until um, 1980. 
83 or 84. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was ordained in 1986. I was, you know, I became a, a lay person, I guess, in, I, don't, I think, 1970, maybe 1974. I don't, I don't remember. In 1977, I was ordained as a priest. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just, you know, continued my practice. And that's what I did. Hmm. At some point, you left and moved to Sonoma County, mm -hmm. Santa Rosa, uh, and uh, but you you stayed, you you know you continued, uh, uh, at least having some involvement with the Zen Center and with uh, groups out there, right? No, I didn't. No, not at all. Um, no, um, I don't even know if it's appropriate to go into uh, the circumstances surrounding my leaving the Zen Center. Oh, please. Uh, but, um, well, um, uh, it's a complicated and very painful story. But basically, um, my mother died in... 1973 while I was at Tassajara. Yeah. And um, I had a stepfather who um, their relationship, as I alluded to earlier, was extremely toxic. My relationship with my mother was, was toxic. Mm. Um, the relationship with the, those two was very toxic. And that was a key reason why 10 days after I graduated from college, I just thought, I've got to get the hell out of here. Where were you from? Massachusetts, the Boston area. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, so um, basically what happened is that um, um, my mother was deathly ill in 1973, and I came back to see her um, basically on her, it was pretty much on her deathbed. She was very, very ill with cancer. And uh, she gave me a couple of bank books and she said, you know, uh, my, my husband has basically taken all of my money uh, and I managed to keep this out of his hands. This is for you. Mm. Um, and subsequently what happened, what I learned subsequently was that uh, she had inherited her, her, her father's um, inheritance when he died in around 19, late 1960s and the money was in her name and then my stepfather who was an accountant and a very unscrupulous character got a hold of it and basically stole my mine and my sister's inheritance with the exception of a few thousand dollars. Um, I was you know extremely upset by all this situation and so I just thought you know I just can't I can't deal with money. The capitalist system itself, you know, when I, one of the reasons I left um, Massachusetts and determined to become a Zen person was because I just said, this is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and I don't want to eat the flesh of dogs. I could, I just, the Vietnam War is going on. You can see the brutality of American culture. Um, I just, I couldn't handle it. And I just thought, I need to be some, I got to get out of here. So basically, I handed these bank books to Richard Baker, and I said, you know, I don't know. I really don't know what to do with this. I don't want it. You know, just I'm going to be here forever, so I'm um, here. And I didn't remember. At, at the time, I remember now, but I forgot that he had said to me, Eric, things can change, and so we'll consider this to be a loan, not a gift because he may need this someday, to his credit. When the uh, scandal with the Zen Center broke out and Richard Baker um, you know, was basically forced to resign, um, I had to decide what I was going to do. Um, because my, you know, I was a disciple of Richard Baker, of Baker Oshi. And now what am I going to do? So I thought, well, maybe what I need to do is uh, I, I could 
I could do a retreat with um, the people at uh, Spirit, not Spirit Rock, at um, the Insight Meditation Society in San Francisco, in um, Massachusetts. Uh -huh. and, and then I could go to visit um, visit uh, Aiken Roshi in Hawaii, and then I can decide where I'm going to practice. Um, at that time, I was working at the bakery, and I said to, to them, you know, I really, I think instead of being on just stipend of $160 a month plus room and board, I really need to be paid some, some money here to save up for my trip. And they said, okay, well, you know, we'll pay you... Uh, Five of five dollars an hour, even though they were charging customers ten dollars an hour when I was personally involved in something. So right there, I can feel like I'm being exploited here. Um, um, I went to Blanche and I said, you know, I had this money that I had given to Zen Center, and now I'm going to need it because I I want to take these trips. She said to me. Um, Eric, that happened. You gave that to them 10 years ago. Gave us to us 10 years ago. That doesn't matter anymore. Strike number two. Mm -hmm. We don't give a fuck about you. We just want your money. You work in the bakery. We sit around in our meetings talking about this and that. And we're having a nice life while you're doing all the work and making the money. Bullshit. So that was, um, so my attitude towards the Zen Center was changing, you know, dramatically towards the negative. So um, I, I managed to scrape together enough money to, um, first I went to Ruth Dennison's place. She was a Vipassana teacher in Southern California. And when I, I went there and I was doing a, I don't remember how long a retreat it was before I decided to go to uh, San Francisco, going, going back to the United States going back to um, Massachusetts. And at that point, the kind of the floodgates of these repressed emotions of, of feeling abused and taken advantage of were, became very, very strong. And um, so I was having a reaction to basically, you could say kind of deprogramming myself from what I perceived to be, you know, a, an organization that has Buddhist it's Buddhist, but there's a cult-like aspect to it. You know, it's extremely ingrown. They don't want to, they don't, they're not even supporting me to go and visit other places. You know, I've been a monk with them for years. Why can't I visit other places? And, you know, I, I could, if I went there and they supported me and we were on good terms, I could come back and make it better. You know, but it's all Suzuki Roshi, Suzuki Roshi, Suzuki Roshi. That's all it is. And so I felt this is a very ingrown situation. Mm -hmm. And as far as my, my Zen, as far as my, my Bodhisattva practice, this is, Bodhisattva practice is knowledge of all modes. That means, you know, like Sudhana in the Avatamsaka Sutra, you go and you travel, you visit things, you, you broaden your horizons. Mm -hmm. And I felt that I was basically, you know, uh, uh, suffocating there. And I was getting no support, you know. So I felt this is not a this is not a healthy situation. So um, then I went to. Um, I was on a bus from San Francisco to Massachusetts, and I tore the cartilage in my knee. I was doing zazen on the bus. The bus lurched. I tore the cartilage in my knee, and when I in San Francisco, I'm hobbling around with a bum knee, and. Um, in the full impact of, of this whole situation uh, while I was in the retreat was, was just overwhelming. I couldn't really, I was not in a sense practicing. I couldn't calm my mind because my mind was, it was like a, a volcano of all this repressed stuff that had been going on for, for you know, for years. So, mm -hmm. um, and how am I going to pay for this operation? So um, at that time, uh, I won't mention names because it's too confidential. But one of my one of my friends at the Zen Center said, "Well, you know, my husband um, knows about your situation. He might be able to help you out." So um, she asked him, and he said, "Yeah, well, uh, yeah, Eric gave about eight thousand bucks to the Zen Center and gave, gave, but." Um, 
we'd be willing to give them back. Um, you know, we're, we're not sure whether we, the, the board talked about it. We didn't know whether we should give them fifty-five hundred dollars or fifty-two hundred dollars, and so we decided to give them fifty-two hundred dollars. And I just thought, here I am. I have no job. I have no home. I have a medical bill that I have to pay, and you're stiffing me for a lousy 300 bucks. Is this what you people are about? And so um, after the retreat, I came back. I got my operation. The, the doctor fortunately recognized my situation and didn't charge me full price, so that was helpful. I came back to, this, to San Francisco, and I said, this is bullshit. You know, I want my money back. You know, what, are you, what have you people been doing? This is all outrageous. And oh, by the way, they were their idea was they were paying me my stipend out of my gift. So they're not even they're not they're not even paying me. They're paying me with my own money. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what? If I have no health insurance. What happens if I get cancer? Well, there's nothing we can do about it. Now, I had um, they had suggested that I. Get um, uh, get Medicare or I guess Medi-Cal, and I said, well, I can't get Medi-Cal because theoretically uh, there's this asset that I have that I have to declare, and if I declare it, I don't get any. I can't qualify for Medi-Cal. They said, well, lie about it. I hope I don't get sued by these people, you know, for for defamation. But oh bullshit! Don't worry about yeah. that. Well, I'm being, you know, I'm being a little bit facetious, but it's yeah. it's so much water under the bridge at this point that it, you know, it, I'm just you ask me, I'm just telling you. Yeah. Uh, so, no, I um, think I think people would be very sympathetic to what you were saying. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, and I wasn't the only one. You know, there was Zen Center bought a lot of buildings and things with money that was donated by students. And there were other people who were in my situation who didn't get anything back. And the only reason why I got it back was because I put a lot of pressure on them. And eventually they they said, well, we did a full accounting. We realized that uh, you actually gave $18,000. We'll give you two thirds of it back and we'll give you 11,200. We'll give you 11,000 instead of 11,200. And if you don't like that, um, we're going to have a, a board meeting, and if you complain at the board meeting, we won't give you anything. So, you know, I accepted the settlement and said, you know, that's it, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. And um, so my relationships with them, I, did, I didn't go back to Zen Center for 30 years, and I stopped practicing for nine. I completely stopped practicing. I was in a, just a state of complete, you know, uh, trauma about the whole situation. Mm. It sounds like it wasn't a loan, like it was considered a gift. Uh, because uh, 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 Richard Baker instituted the third, two thirds rule that if somebody gave a gift to Sin Center and then later was having hard times, they could get two thirds of it back. But um, I loaned money to Sin Center. I gave Sin Center thousands of dollars and then. You know, I'd get it back. I just go into the Treasury Department and and say, uh, "How about so?" And I I didn't need a lot at that time, but over a period of years, funny thing is, Steve Weintraub was treasurer. Uh, I had I had uh, used it all up, and he kept giving me money, <laughs> so that when he, he, uh, when David, what's his name, David Weinstein came in as treasurer. He didn't know me, and he was very businesslike. He'd been in the government. And he asked me uh, what, what I was going to do about my debt to Zen Center. I said, oh, don't worry about it. You'll, you'll get it. I, I get money now and then. And he he was shocked that, that I didn't say, well, let's establish a plan now or anything. But people told him, don't worry about it. <laughs> uh but so yours sound like yours was considered a gift and not a loan, because also they paid me interest. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't. I mean, they they treated me exactly the opposite. Richard Baker told me that it would be 
this is nothing was ever in writing. Nothing. I didn't have anything in writing either. You know, Richard Baker told me at the time, uh, this is a loan, you might get something back. And then I found out much later, I only found out, you know, when I was leaving that they invoked this two thirds rule. Uh huh. So uh -huh. I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. Um, so I was basically acting completely under their, their, you know, well, they were uh, considering it a gift that you were getting, uh, uh, that back, I also gave money to Zen Center uh, in the early days, thousands. Um, I see. Well, I didn't have that kind of money to give. Yeah. But I wanted to mention one other thing is that um, since since all the dirty laundry is coming out, is that um, a couple of years later, a few years later, I visited Steve, and I had never had any kind of you know um, um, negative feelings about him. I just I thought he's He's, you know, one of the people who's in center, a nice guy, you know, like that. And um, he, at that time, he had become a psychologist, and we had lunch together. I think, we, no, we just had a meeting. And he said, you know, Zen Center actually uh, acted toward you illegally. Bingo. Uh -huh. So, and I, I went to a lawyer and they said, you know, you've got no proof, you've got no evidence, there's no, you can't make a case, there's, there's nothing you can do about it. So it was only because I think um, I had exerted, you know, considerable pressure on them. I was making a big public stink about it uh, when I came back. And I was in a terrible situation, you know, no job, no, what am I going to do? You know, um, so... Um, Anyway, um, they eventually gave me, you know, gave me back, you know, some of the money that I had given them. Or yeah. And whatever they describe it. And, yeah. And I went on with my life. And for, as I say, for 13, 30 years, um, 19, this is 1984, I didn't see them again. I never went back again. Mm -hmm. Now, in 2014, I had gone to China and I thought, this is just this is so phenomenal, you know, to have actually been at Linji's temple, been to Huinang's temple. Um, and this is something that American, this could be very inspiring for American Buddhists. This is, yeah. this is just wonderful. And, and I know how to do it because I, I did it. So I went back to the Zen center in, um, Sent the city center, and I walk in, and uh, Victoria Austin was there, and you know she was shocked and happy to see me, and a couple of other people who recognized me, and uh, and then Dick, um, Ed Satizan was there, and he said, oh yeah, let's talk, and I told him you know how, what what I've been doing in my life, and that I've been to China, and he says, oh that's really interesting, okay yeah that's yeah that's a great idea, and um, and then I went to Green Gulch. And I saw Reb, and I hadn't seen Reb in 30 years. And Rusa was there, and she was so happy to see me, and everything was wonderful. And I said, you know, this would be really great, you know, to, uh, you know, we could have tours to China. And um, and uh, he gave me his email address, and I contacted him a couple of times, and never heard back from me, anybody. So they're obviously not interested. So that's it. Oh yeah. yeah, I've had a lot of experiences like that. I would consider <laughs> various things and not hearing back. But you know, they're just all busy and they're thinking about other things. Uh, but that, um, that's 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 the point. You yeah, know? I mean, they. You know, when I was there, you know, in 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 nineteen eighty two or eighty, I guess it was nineteen eighty two. We were close to a nuclear war at that time because the Reagan administration had... Yeah, been, yeah, I was working have, with the nuclear freeze then. That's right, that's right. And we would go down to the uh, financial district in San Francisco with a big sign, Vigil for Nuclear Disarmament. And that was under, that was Richard Baker's, you know, um, initiative. He was encouraging us to... to be yeah, the, very supportive of that. Yeah. And um, he went to Russia... Um, himself, uh, which was, I think he probably could have 
spent, uh, he, could have, he didn't have to stay at the Park Avenue Hotel. I mean, he could have stayed at a place cheaper. He, he did but, more than that. He went with uh, Mike Murphy, a U.S. People's, U.S. Russia People's Friendship Association, and he spent $50,000 on that trip. Uh, well, this is, this is and, and, you know, uh, I mean, he was really into uh, peace and all that. But, um, you know, it was it's what I call the imperial era. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, he, he should have gotten outside funding for that. But he was trying to do something very good. Uh, there, there was too big an entourage, you know, and uh, <laughs> all that. Right. So, I mean, to his credit, you know, he did something. And, and at that time, there was some sense of social consciousness in the Zen Center. And, uh, and I, I should, um, you know, thank him for that. that hey, was... Eric, you've got competition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you hear that? Um, oh, sorry. There's some street noise. What? What is that? Oh, it's just some somebody on the street announcing something. Who knows what it is? Yeah, yeah. Um, All right, it's low understand. enough now. Yeah, I, I didn't understand what you meant by competition, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I thought you were referring to our discussion. But, no, um, I was referring to yeah. somebody's talking louder than you. <laughs> right, right. Um, in any case, um, uh, yeah, I felt like, um, you know, uh, he, Richard Baker, to his credit, you know, was thinking about larger issues, social issues at the time, which needed to be addressed. And I think that was completely appropriate. Um, and... Um, um, and I and you know when I went back to I, I went back to Zen Center and I talked with somebody you know one of my old friends there and and I raised the issue of you know international tensions and I don't talk politics. I just thought you know, this is a very ingrown, organ very very ingrown organization that is uh, it's just not healthy. Well, and, um, yeah, but it's always changing and the people are different and. You know, it's right. Right, it's been super involved in all sorts of social work, and uh, um, you know, people in it have have been involved. I mean, John John uh, Bales was uh, president of uh, uh, the nuclear freeze thing there while he was at Zen Center, and some people thought he should do it, but he said, mm -hmm. "To heck with you." Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, John, uh, I'm actually uh, on Facebook with John, and we, uh, we're we not in, like, personal contact, um, but I get his posts, and, you know, he's, he's got some useful things to say. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but in any case, I just, you know, you know, I think maybe you can get the sense that, um, you know, after living in the United States for years, I just thought, you know... Um, I was born in the wrong country. I just do, I do not <laughs> my my values, how I think. I am not wired as a dualistic person who um, uh, you know thinks in categories of east versus west and west is the best and and this sort of thing. I'm I'm much more you know. I don't know. It's not non non dual non dualism, you know. So there's a this is this is like when people are talking about the the major uh, conflict that we have now. We can say it's between the unipolar world and the multipolar world. The unipolar world is America sets the rules and we take the orders, and the rest of the world is saying no. You know, we're we're all intelligent we all have the capability of, of improving our lives for ourselves and our countries and as, as ourselves as individuals and we don't want to take orders from anybody and the the u.s mindset is that we're right everybody else is wrong and i at a certain point i just thought i, I just don't think that way um and so i came to thailand which is a kind of like a neutral space mm -hmm. um where i could live my life 
free of all of that social pressure, which I felt in the, in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, people talk about, you know, totalitarian regimes, but in the U S if you, if you make statements that go against the mainstream as just in, in your social circles, you will be punished for it, not in taken to jail, but you'll be marginalized. And so um, I realized, fine, you know, have your have your society. Let it be what it is. I, I've got better things to do with my life. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna fix my own problems on the internal side, and as I do that, I'll pay attention to things that are relevant to the whole world. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we can't. And the thing is, people often make the mistake of thinking, well. You can't fix the planet. It's all beyond your control. So just work on yourself. And there are other people who say, forget yourself. That's just it's selfish. You need to work on the planet. And I say, well, I think we need to do both. Yeah. Uh, we, need to, we need to simultaneously in, uh, work on our own, uh, cultivating our own character, working on our own problems, learning how to be harmonious with other people on a personal and interpersonal level. And at the same time, figure out a way to transform our society so that we can, um, you know, progress as a, as, a, as a species instead of on the path that we're on, which is, um, you know, very adversarial and dualistic and self-destructive. Yeah. Well, uh, that sounds right. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, I uh, salute you for trying to reduce the destruction. And um, uh, I do little tiny things, uh, but uh, I don't know how much it's helping. But I, I believe in in uh, doing, uh, not associating uh, what one is doing with, with uh, the odds of it being effective necessarily. Sometimes it's just because you think it's right. And, That's right. Uh, uh, you know, I was involved uh, somewhat in, in civil rights work in the South. And I didn't, I didn't help anything. I was, it was, I was just like in the way because I was so crazy and everything. And I was with SDS, same thing. Uh, and, did other things. I ne never necessarily felt anything I was doing was going to uh, save the universe or anything, but I was glad I did it. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, right. I wish I'd do more. Uh, right. Well, Gandhi said that, you know, he said, uh, whatever you do will be insignificant, and it's very important that you do it. Yeah, that's and, well uh, said. That's well said. Yeah. And uh, Chris Hedges, do you know, do you know Chris Hedges? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I like Chris, Chris Hedges. Hedges. Yeah, Chris Hedges, you know, he's a journalist. He's, he's got a lot of really good things to say. And he says, I don't fight fascists because I think I'm going to win. I fight fascists because they're fascists. <laughs> oh, I love Chris Hedges. And uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the uh, fella he's associated with uh, who started, uh, helped start Ramparts, uh, uh Robert Shear? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hedges and Shear involved a lot. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Hedges put out a, a, um, a, a graphic, it wasn't a novel, it was a graphic account of his travel around America called America's sacrifice zones or something about places mm -hmm. where people were so down and out they were just mm -hmm. off the radar you know right uh, right i've heard of that in uh, uh indian reservations uh super enclaves of super poor people in ghettos and in the south and various mm -hmm. things like that uh anyway yeah, i admire him a lot and uh, you know they always had another take uh on uh that like you say they certainly weren't giving you the cnn line or the fox line or the mm -hmm. anything like that mm -hmm. right. uh, but you know the the changing times 
I, I don't know. They're pretty old now. I don't know what they're doing now. Uh, he's a uh, Hedges was um, he was some sort of minister, right? He got he had a, uh, a degree in divinity from Harvard University. Uh huh. So uh-huh. he was trained to be a minister. Yeah. Um. um in the, but of course, he ended up becoming a journalist, you know, a very prominent journalist, yeah. even for the New York Times. And then, because of the courage of his convictions, he um, he was basically shown the door, or he he you know said, I, I, "If you if you want me to spout the party line on, I, I forget the specific issue of the day, uh, I'm not going to do it. I'm out of here." You know, I don't. It was kind of like yeah. a mutual. Mutual rejection, so to speak, as yeah. I understand. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, Eric, um, uh, I've really enjoyed talking with you. This has been good. This has been very interesting. Uh, got a pretty big picture of your life there and what you're doing now. And uh, uh, is there anything you want to say in conclusion? <laughs> Or is there anything we've missed? Um, well, I'm sure that there's something that we've missed because, you know, uh, you and I go back a long way. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, human experience itself is infinite. So I'm sure that we have we have more things that we could talk about. But, I, you know, I think we've, we've covered it pretty well. You know, I mean, there's a lot of issues that we, we've covered quite yeah. well. So I, I really appreciate your... Yeah. your um, getting in touch with me so that um, uh, it's great just for you and I to talk because we haven't had, you know, uh, our modern society is, um, is designed to uh, fragment and atomize people. Yeah. And uh, fortunately, there are some technological aspects of it which allows people like you and I who go back, you know, 50 years at this point uh, to reconnect and to uh, exchange ideas, and that's a great thing. Yeah. So yeah. hopefully we can continue it, you know, on some level. Yeah. Hmm. Well, uh, yeah. And uh, maybe we'll get back there to Chiang Mai. Uh, it sure mm-hmm. had changed. I was there in 88 <laughs> when I went back, uh, whenever we saw, you know, like, 2017 or something or 16. Right, right. A very different. It's a far, far more uh, developed. Or you oh. could say. Um, uh, oh God! And, yes. And the, see, the thing with uh, Chiang Mai is that uh, it's basically a big. Uh, it depends a lot on tourism, and um, Chiang Mai has gone through you know many changes because of the kinds of people who came as tourists and. When I came in 2004, it was basically European and American backpackers. And as time went on, more Oriental people who had, as the Oriental, you know, uh, Japan, Korea, China, um, especially uh, their economies developed, you started seeing a lot more um, people from Asia coming. Yeah. Then COVID hit and the whole this, this situation just kind of crashed. And yeah. um, it's just starting to recover now. Mm. Um, so uh, it's you know Chiang Mai has gone through a lot of changes too. It's modernizing. I just got an invitation to a dinner that cost the unheard of thirty five dollars, and I've never spent more than fifteen for fifteen for me is dollars is extravagant. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, that is a lot of money. Now, there are restaurants now where you can pay you know a lot more than. Uh, I mean, you can get a you can get a, a reasonable meal here for about uh, three to five dollars you know, at a at a relatively decent restaurant. Um, still, um, and I'm living at you know probably one quarter of, of what it would cost for me to live in the United States. Yeah. So, um, and I, it's probably the same for you in, in Indonesia. Yeah. Um, and and oh, there's such great food in Thailand. Right. And the feeling, the thing about Thailand is probably the same reason why you're in Indonesia, is that it's just, it's just nice, you know? Yeah. You're just, you're just, just your daily experiences with people. 
people are just nice. Yeah, you know, I, that's right. I go to the market every Saturday, and it's a it's a local market. It's not a supermarket. It's just like lots of little micro businesses, you know, selling their vegetables or selling their chicken or selling their fish or whatever it is. And you give them your money. They give you their stuff. You smile. They smile. Everybody's happy. And um, that's how human. That's how it should be in human society. Yeah. Not impersonal. You fill a basket of food. You take it to the counter. It's scanned. You give them the money. You're out of there. Nothing. It's just a complete transactional. There's no human feeling at all. And that's uh, so. The, and of course, that's that's prevalent in in um, it's. I would, yeah, I would say it's prevalent in, in Thailand and a lot of the world, but you still have that kind of feeling of, of you know, um, basic uh, human, basic humanity between people. Yeah, people, kind of people there, people here are polite with each other and friendly. Right, exactly. Uh, and uh, like it uh, here... You know, some I, I work at home a lot, and I, I like to go out for a walk. And I don't always go to the beach. I'll, I walk out on the street. You know, almost everybody I pass, I can stop and talk to if I want. I or will at least say hello. They'll ask where am I going or whatever, mm-hmm. say something. Mm-hmm. It's, um, uh, yeah, I really, I relating to the people here is is the greatest thing about it mm-hmm. right. uh, to me. Mm-hmm. You know, not right. the scenery, and uh, not the ceremonies. And that stuff's all good too. But I just mm-hmm. like yeah, relating mm-hmm. to people here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Understand. Yeah. Well, so we're both having pretty good experiences in Asia. I still miss my friends in America, but um, they can come here. <laughs> right. <laughs> Say hello. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Eric, and uh, stay in touch, and good talking with you. Great to talk with you, too. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Well, thanks a lot, Eric. Appreciate it. And um, you sure live closer to us than... uh, most people I know that don't live <laughs> here. Uh, so who knows? Maybe we'll touch base again. I love Thailand. But, you know, I'm really not interested in traveling or doing anything or going anywhere. We're going to go. we got to take a break. You know, the last, we, we, we don't take that many. So we're going to go four days over on the East Coast to a little village called Ahmed. There's some nice snorkeling there. Uh, But mainly I just need to get away and not spend too much time on all this cute archive stuff and spend time walking around and swimming and staring. So uh, that'll be a nice break. Uh, And uh, it's only a few hours away. That's about as much time as I want to spend traveling. But we'll see. You never know what's going to happen in the future. Okay. So thanks a lot, Eric. And this has been a QQ Audio Podcast. I'm DC Poopa of QQ Audio and QQ Archives. Coming to you from Sleepy Senor with Doggy Bandita, Feline Kuchita, and Dear Lovely Katrinka. And we're wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening. Thank you.